We are live. Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, January 18th, and we are continuing our discussion on H 546, an act relating to racial justice statistics. And our first witness will be Leo Thompson from the Attorney General's Office. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Just making sure I'm still here. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general and director of the Civil Rights Unit. Um, I also um, uh, am uh, on the uh, the uh, racial disparities advisory panel, which uh, has already uh, presented reports and testimony to the committee. I joined the uh, that uh, panel or RDAP as it's known. Um, in the fall of um, 2021, after David Scher, who was our office's designee, had uh, left the office to uh, to join the Cannabis Control Board. So I came to this uh, subject relatively late in the process, although I had att attended some meetings before where they were discussing uh, the, the needs to collect and, and compile and house and analyze uh, uh, racial uh, um, uh, disparities related statistics in the state. Um, my angle on it, is, it has been a little bit different um, from at least some of the witnesses. My, my angle on it uh, comes not from being someone who works in the criminal justice or juvenile system because I don't, I work in, in civil rights area. But um, I do have, um, some prior and ongoing experience in similar projects that have been conducted in different parts of the country, uh, going back to uh, a, a massive data project um, for Los Angeles County involving the Sheriff's Department, which has about 17,000 employees and houses about 20,000 people in the LA County Jail, uh, as well as a similar kind of data analysis projects for the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, DC, the Seattle Police Department. Uh, I am currently working on um, some, some of these issues uh, for the consent decree monitor for uh, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and I'm also working on it for um, uh, providing some technical assistance to the Department of Justice for the Baltimore Police Department con consent decree. Um, so those projects really dealt with impacts as they were felt largely through policing, but also through uh, enf enforcement of probation and, and some housing uh, for people who were, who were uh, confined to the jail system. Um, I'm not, and I come from it, not from um, the standpoint of someone who's a data expert, because I'm not a data expert, but rather someone who um, really developed over time experience with systems analysis of this sort. Um, and so that was the background that I brought, um, I think, to the RDAP. And, and I think it would inform the brief testimony that I would offer today, um, which is that um, I, I know last week I listened to the testimony about some of the finer details of what this Office of Statistics would do. Um, I just want to point out a, a couple of things that weren't raised in the prior testimony, or at least, and, and emphasize some some things that were brought up. Um, one uh, one thing I think uh, my experience in kind of touching upon this area over the years is that um, you have to uh, everyone and it needs to appreciate that this process is a slow process, um, and it and it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. Um, it is um, every project I've been involved in, um, the people who are either mandating or agree that they're going to launch the project, of course, wants the data wants to start parsing it. Um, but oftentimes, uh, and this is really related to, this, to the second point, one reason that it's slow is that this process, which is such a healthy process, will inevitably, uh, unless Vermont is, is the sole outlier that I've heard, I've encountered will inevitably identify business practices um, which don't quite meet with what the agency or department says it should be doing. Um, 
many departments in my uh, my past experience, they have lots of databases that are designed to capture lots of data. Uh, and when you go in and start compiling the databases and finding out how things are recorded, you'll find that there are de facto business rules that arise where people don't find it efficient in their operations day to day to fill in all those fields. And, so, and they might have supplemental data that they keep on their own. Sometimes it's on paper that is maybe of day-to-day -day use to that department or agency, but is completely off the radar, so to speak, from a, from a data standpoint. And so part of the data compilation process isn't just getting copies, um, getting copies of, uh, of databases and trying to translate them. It also means field visits, going to offices and asking people, interviewing people and asking them how they keep records. Um, do some people, you'll find that some managers keep additional data, but they keep it in Microsoft Word documents, not even spreadsheets. And, um, uh, and those discoveries, and they're always surprises, um, are a necessary part of finding out what's actually there and what can speak uh, to the analysts, what's actually going to be usable. It is, um, and so that's part of the, that's part of the, the lengthiness of it. Um, it is, um, so it is time consuming, it takes a lot of work, but it's also terrifically healthy for the organization um, because um, sometimes you will find in a given department or agency, people on different floors who wish they had data that the other person on the other floor is keeping and they had no way, no way of knowing it. Or they will use, um, uh, again, paper-driven systems, log books, um, that will sometimes capture critical data that can still be used with appropriate caveats, but might be completely unknown to the executives on the top floor of, of a given building. Um, so it's a terrific, it's a terrifically healthy process. Um, there are lots of confidentiality statutes that come into play here. And so those will have to be worked out between um, this bureau and, um, you know, the data experts and also the agency professionals who are there, who have the obligation to maintain confidentiality. Um, a lot of what's in the, the, the how of the data compilation that's in this bill and that was reflected in the RDAP report is pretty standard stuff. Um, creating a data dictionary and all of that, it's pretty standard trade um, in terms of um, the how of data compilation. What's really the critical important policy questions, I, I think for the committee to hear in the testimony are really the what and the why, and also the who. Um, so what data are you going to collect or, or do you wanna start collecting and creating? Uh, why you want to do that? Uh, and who's gonna be involved in making those decisions? Um, and um, this bill, uh, one, one notable feature of the bill is that the, the council for the uh, it, providing input on, on that data collection is pretty big. It's, it's like 18 members, it's very large. Um, and uh, I guess the only comment I could offer or maybe hopefully beneficial perspective on at least some of the representations. So there's quite a bit of community representation including people who've uh, uh, who've been involved in juvenile justice or, or um, criminal justice on the receiving end, uh, is how important it is to keep those voices involved. Um, uh, you know, my very first big project I mentioned earlier was Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I worked there as a deputy monitor, so I was a civilian monitor looking at uh, treatment of, of inmates in the, in the LA jail, which at that time had 23,000 beds. And they had rudimentary data systems and they told us everything um, when we went into audit to see what they tracked. But then we just, we went to all the different units and we talked to the people who resided in those units and found out that there was basically a shadow disciplinary system that was not on the books. Um, and it, they had their own kind of consistent rules, but they weren't actually being recorded um, anywhere in the system. Um, so asking people who actually have 
had personal involvement uh, in the systems, I think can be really critical. Uh, it's not to say here that we'll have that kind of discovery in Vermont, but there may be um, aspects of how the system's administered and practiced um, that just is not is, is not um, showing up on the radar of the, uh, the folks who are gonna be compiling data. And it also, um, you're likely to get better questions and a, and a broader range of questions to ask of the data analysts once you do start amassing a pool of data and what directions uh, to pursue or what disparities or issues to address um, where data is not being captured at all. Uh, and then the rest of the council will, will work with the experts and figuring out, you know, what is what is doable, um, what achieve what's achievable, and when. Um, so, uh, I think as you take testimony on um, uh, aspects of the bill, such as the membership of the council, I, I just wanted to uh, highlight that that the importance. And I think the RDAP likewise felt for, for similar reasons. I, I mean, I brought my own experiences uh, to bear on that, but for similar reasons. And I think that's important. Um, the, the last thing I, I guess I would, I would just raise, and this is, again, a little bit on, on the technical side. Um, and it's just something to elicit in the testimony because it came up last week which is the issue about whether the data that's drawn from this bureau is, a, is public record or not. Uh, I, I think the intent, I, I'm guessing here, but I, th I think the intent probably was um, that the information that's provided by the agencies to the bureau doesn't lose whatever exemption it has by, by virtue of being brought to the bureau as you know, de-identified information, but that if that if that information were already public record and not exempt, that it wouldn't suddenly become exempt once it, it enters into the bureau. Um, I think that's it, but but if it if there were something that under an MOU could retains its confidentiality, um, uh, it wouldn't otherwise, I think, uh, lose its public records exemption. Because I think if that happens, then it's likely you're going to have conflict about what records can be shared in what format if something that's held by uh, professionals dealing with you know, the juvenile justice system would lose its exemption uh, from public records by going to a different branch of state government. In fact, that might jeopardize uh, state or federal grants as well as compliance with federal law. I think that's the idea. I think the, the other issue will be just how to treat the work product uh, of the professionals there. And I don't have uh, an answer from our office about that. We wanted to hear testimony more from different uh, stakeholders and professionals about the sort of work product that they would create uh, and whether that that would be subject to the public records law uh, or not. So we don't really have a position at this time. But I think that as it's drafted now, I think the uh, saying that the data that's collected is not a public record, I think is probably not accurate. I mean, I think it is, if it's collected, it is a public record, then the question is just whether it's exempt or not. Uh, and if it had an exemption, does it lose it or not? And I think, at least in the RDAP discussions, I think we were thinking that something wouldn't lose its exemption and that would facilitate the sharing of information for data sharing agreements. But that's that's a little bit, maybe that's a kind of a couple of bridges ahead for the committee. So I'll stop there and answer any questions or try to if, if anyone has any. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, I Appreciate you addressing the um, the public records questions because we are going to hear from um, Ledge Council in a little bit because because we have heard, we did hear a, um, testimony about that so so um, so thank you uh, I see that um, that Representative Richardson has a uh, a question go ahead Barbara thank you um, so so what I, I've got sort of two general themes of questions. One is um, making sure that people are not, um, well, 
let me put it this way. Remember a few years ago with um, law enforcement collection in Vermont, we had some issues with um, accuracy or people trying to make the numbers, uh, make the data help them to look like they were doing okay. So my, my first um, of two questions, if that's okay, Madam Chair, is from your, from your experience working in all these other municipalities, which is amazing and you, it's, it's great that we have you here. Um, do you have thoughts about that? Because my second one kind of is tied to this. Yeah, so, I mean, I think part of the, um, you know, basically preventing uh, either the, the analysis or reporting uh, of, of any analysis of data to essentially be a whitewashing exercise for the agency, that's, that's a concern for any kind of project where government either voluntarily as Vermont is looking at it to doing it voluntarily or whether it's done in a compulsory way where it's part of a federal or state consent decree. Um, it's important to, to have that balance and, and also transparency. So I think there are a couple of provisions in, in here that do that. One again is having diversity uh, on, the, on the council, which is basically in, going to be providing a lot of um, input uh, and assessment of, again, what, what data are we collecting, what we're doing with it, uh, and how we're interpreting that. And that includes using outside experts. So you've heard testimony already from a couple of non-state uh, actors, like from University of Vermont, for example. So that's really important. Uh, for example, I'll give you, uh, a good example of that would be the Seattle Police Department. I, I worked for the consent decree monitor for Seattle um, from 2013 until about 2017. Um, and um, uh, we were dissatisfied. We, so the federal monitor reports to the judge who has the case, the consent decree, and enforces it through contempt orders. And we were concerned that the, the city at that time was not was overly optimistic about the data they had, what they could report and what could, they could use for what was that what was called an early intervention system, which was a way of using data to flag officers who are accumulating complaints, lawsuits, uh, excessive force uh, allegations and so forth. Um, and um, and it, we were the outsider looking at that and we used some subject matter as experts and um, the city provided one picture of what they could do or were doing. And then um, after we issued a public report on that and reported that to the judge in court, uh, and then the city hired uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to do an independent analysis. And they found many more problems than, than we did um, and, and issued a public report on that. So that relates to the second uh, check on that sort of thing, which is public reporting and and. The bill here has, I think, a robust um, a system of public reporting. I think that you're going to find no shortage of criminal justice experts out there, not just in Vermont, but all over the country that will be very interested in the public reporting on the data here. And, uh, and that was true also in, in these other jurisdictions. We had no difficulty uh, finding uh, criminal justice professors and, and uh, and other experts who um, who have enormous interest on the idea of government, you know, conducting its own or, or unearthing its its data and 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 making that publicly available, uh, and many you know many weaknesses in the systems, and sometimes those outsiders quarrel amongst themselves on their own nickel um, about the best way to uh, to ask questions and and to analyze them. So the broader theme, I guess, that ties those two points together is transparency. That's a critical feature. So my, my second question is about um, making sure it's enforced in all three branches. And I don't know what authority we have to do that. Um, in particular, um, being on the Judicial Nominating Committee 
and trying to read about um, best practices, uh, especially looking at um, diversity on our in our courts, like it would it's it's highly recommended that we collect that kind of data. And so I guess I'm just wondering if you can speak to where where our limits are and how can we get buy-in from all three branches? Yeah, so I, I don't have experience at the state level before, but I, I do it at the city and county level, which includes collecting data from prosecutors' offices and courts. Uh, and the way the bill is designed here seems to me to be the, the common sense way to do it, which is to view this as a collaborative pro project rather than as some other cities that I, I wasn't involved in would, you know, would give an office subpoena authority. I think that's always, uh, you know, that that is in some uh, in some, uh, you know, corners of different governments that's viewed as handing someone a loaded gun. Uh, and even if it's in the holster, uh, it's still loaded. Um, so I think, you know, not not going to subpoena power, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, and I have not been in contact with the judiciary, now, and and I think you'll you'll hear uh, from the judiciary on on that. But I think there's an I mean my experience with other um, other judicial systems at the again municipal level is that there's enormous interest in them wanting to see how they're operating. Um, uh, the you know the judges and judicial officers have enormous interest, but very little insight as to how they're acting collectively. Um, and um, uh, I think, uh, you know, consistent with their oaths and also with a lot of professional training that uh, judges have been receiving in the country in the last 15, 20 years, I think. Um, I think, it, you know, taking it as a collaborative effort and bringing everyone along, um, and I think those interactions, when you're interacting with the agencies, and that includes the courts, is that they all have their own set of questions that they wanna ask of themselves for their own purposes of self-examination uh, and growth um, uh, in terms of how they wanna act uh, or uh, be, because they, I think, will have an interest in identifying blind spots in not only in how their judges are performing on the bench, but what happens when the parties are dismissed and, and they leave the courtroom? Um, so I think that um, the collaborative approach that's in this bill is pretty consistent with what I've seen. And I, I haven't really seen resistance from the judicial branch. Um, <coughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Any other, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Julio. Um, so this is a question that you probably heard me ask if you watched it last week's testimony uh, and would certainly like your input on this as well. And that is, um, and it goes to one of the questions that you asked it, that's gonna be important. That's what data is uh, to collect. And we, we have the other bill, uh, H317, where we lay out in detail the data. Uh, so it'd be a statutory mandate. Uh, this bill, uh, does it by rule instead. Uh, the other option that I've wanted input on as well is whether we just allow uh, the division to do this essentially through policy, not have to go through a rulemaking process uh, to determine what data they should collect. And if you have an, uh, any views or that you could share about those three approaches and what we should think about doing uh, or which way we should go, uh, I'd be appreciated. Sure, this isn't something I've discussed with my office, so I can just offer you my own, my own view on it. I think that um, the first year of this project is going to be so occupied with just understanding literally the data systems out there that there won't be a lot of time to be asking really detailed questions and then running the numbers. Um, the, the, the way it usually works is that there are two tracks. There are the people who are, uh, you know, cracking the hood on computer systems and the like to find out what data is in there. And then there's a parallel track for people who are um, 
who are trying to figure out what sort of questions to ask. Um, and so there, and there, so there is time that's built into the project for kind of the question des designers to have the have the opportunity to think and to develop their list of questions. It would sort of be um, like if you bought, you know, bad analogy, but if, you know, if you wanted to open a restaurant and, you know, you bought one and someone's in the back kind of taking a, a look and seeing what burners work and what's in the pantry while people are out front designing their menu and trying to figure out what the community is going to eat um, and, and what they need, what's missing. Um, you can do those in parallel. I think putting them out, putting really detailed uh, standards in statute um, is probably the least attractive just because of the lack of flexibility. Um, and um, so if there were going to be uh, areas that were carved out, I think that's good. I don't know that there would be any areas that the legislature would think of that that the Bureau would not. But I think if you if the, if the committee and and the chamber wants to be heard on to make sure these are the minimums, I think that's fine. I just wouldn't get too much in the details. I can tell you from other data projects that um, you can find out you can have a great idea and then and everyone you know is is sort of chilling the champagne and then. Um, a week or two later, it turns out to be horrendously expensive or it puts back your project by two years. Um, and then so you kind of have to pivot and be flexible. Um, so I think, you know, leaving the Bureau the flexibility to, to understand that and say, yeah, we have great questions, but we're gonna need a $4 million software project uh, to, to, to address that. Uh, and it's gonna take four years to build the data. Um, you know, um, whereas there's a mandate to do that by a time certain that that could be challenging um, to do. So rulemaking, um, I haven't encountered that done by rulemaking before. I've only seen general parameters that basically set out the result that you would want to have data that would, you know, on particular subject areas, but not the types, you know, like the types of data that you would require to, you know, whether it's survey data versus incident data. Um, and so I would say leaving most of the, the details for the Bureau, which has a reporting obligation, which I think is really, again, that's really important for people to know what they're doing um, uh, as near contemporaneously as you, as you can manage it, because you, you want them doing the work, not just writing reports, but um, so rulemaking, I'm a little skeptical about, um, at least in the first year, um, because we, we just don't know, you know, we kind of don't know what's under the hood yet. Um, and um, it, it's hard to see how, um, how rulemaking would actually address, you know, address those needs. And so it's a little early, but I think in terms of legislature setting out Kind of the minimum expectations. I think that's a good, that's actually quite a good idea. And in terms of uh, attracting candidates who uh, who will participate uh, either as the professionals here or on the council or as providing expertise from the outside, um, you know that I think that that would, could be quite helpful. And it would also it also may. Um, uh, firm up the basis for uh, grant applications and things like that if um, there's going to be either through the state or in conjunction, in conjunction with, the, with the college or university uh, some grant work if uh, the, you know whoever's providing the money if they see in statute that there is an obligation to address certain topics which, ma which match the grant uh, you know, that may make things a, a little bit easier because it provides the grantor, the grant issuer, a, a second layer of, of accountability. They know you have to comply with the statutory mandate. So I think that can be useful in practice. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? <coughs> no. Not seeing any more, any more questions. So okay. thank you very much. Sure yeah, thing. good to see you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. We will uh, now move to Tanya Marshall, the archivist. 
Good afternoon. Welcome. Oh, we, we can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> I thought I unclicked it. Did it work now? Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, thank you much for having me. I'm Tanya Marshall. I'm this, uh, for the record, I'm Tanya Marshall. I'm the state archivist for the state of Vermont, but I'm also the chief records officer and the director of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, which is part of the Secretary of State's office. And I don't get in this committee very often, so I'll just give you a brief, brief background about myself. But um, my education and training is in information science, um, which is really just the discipline of how to collect, store, retrieve, and use information regardless of the format. Um, it, my background can Continue, contains computer science, system science, um, information use, and so forth. Um, it's the whole process of uh, how people collect and manage information and then the requirements around those. I have a master's degree from uh, University of Maryland, um, and I also have completed all the coursework for a doctorate in the same field. Um, I've been with the state for almost 20 years. Um, so uh, so I, I've lived and breathed that I work with all three branches. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, public records came up um, last week. And also um, I did put in, I did submit some written information if you wanted to look at different things related to that. But the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration was created in 2008 to, to pretty much end a bifurcated system. Um, so agencies didn't know how to manage their information, didn't matter what format it was in. Uh, it was very convoluted practices. Um, and there were num the General Assembly asked for a number of different reports and wanted to get to the thick of the qualitative reasons why things were just the way that they were. And so I was uh, originally hired um, as part of a process of a new law that went through for the State Archives Division of the Secretary of State's office. But then I was also hired at the same time by the Court Administrator's office. Um, so I worked for them both uh, for about two years. Um, and part of that process was developing a report that led to the creation of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. So um, we oversee the statewide records and information management program. And all three branches kind of work with our particular agency to understand all their legal record keeping requirements. We literally inventory we collect, inventory, analyze every single statute that the General Assembly puts out related to records and information, which agency has to collect it, which agency has to uh, produce it, which uh, who do they have to share it with, what are the requirements around that, if it's a specific format. And part of our role is to provide that information to each public agency as part of their overall management plan. Um, by law, we set the retention and disposition for public records and information as well. Um, and so we've been around for about 12 years as part of this very systematic approach um, to records and information management. Um, so I did in reading, you know, H546, and I think that's why Rebecca Turner is that there's a couple of components within there that it, are com very separate from the current structure and organization of government and how we operate in terms of records and information management. And so I'm not sure if that was really the intent of this committee, because a lot of those sections starting on page five of the bill are things that our agencies and departments already do within the structure of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration and why we were developed to provide that support. Um, we have governance committees within the agencies and departments. Some of them are less mature than others. So we do work on a rubric. We're charged to use industry standards and practices. Um, so those would be based on um, information governance at a very high level. And then we would work with each entity. We get down into the weeds of their specific industry standards and requirements. Um, and we build these models within the agency so that they can better understand the information that they are responsible for. They can comply with it. Um, there's eight rubrics that we begin with from a governance standpoint. Um, the first is accountability. And I do have it in the written documentation if you wanted to just see what it is. Um, transparency, in this context, it means documentation, understanding the legal requirements around your records and information, understanding the systems, the structures, the management plans. Um, I think that uh, Julio's testimony was wonderful because it is exactly what we see when we get into the weeds of helping an agency or department move forward. Um, it includes integrity. Everyone wants the right information uh, at the right time we, uh, and protection. So that gets into these exemptions. Um, and I'll talk about the Public Records Act in a minute. Uh, compliance, like I said, we compile every single legal requirement. Um, part of my office is a legislative clerk. So we do work for the leg legislature in that part. We also are uh, oversee the Administrative Procedure Act. So rulemaking comes through the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration as well. Um, availability. 
So making sure that people who do need access to the information have that available access and then retention and disposition. And so within each agency, including the agency of administration where you propose having this particular division, those responsibilities are already established that they need to comply with in that rubric. And then there's also a statute, Title III, um, VSA 218, that itemizes that agencies and departments, specifically administrative departments, so those would be within the governor's cabinet, have very concrete requirements. Um, so I just want to point that part out because in many ways, when I was reading through and, ha and having people contact me, it was that it carves out a section, but now it allocates that responsibility to a different agency, um, seemingly Agency of Digital Services. But it also didn't seem to recognize that within agencies is really mature and really acting. And I think gets to all these things are not just necessarily data sets. They're, they're all over and maybe the agencies are not connecting with each other or even internally. That's what our team does. Um, and we've been working really hard. We're, we're tiny, <laughs> um, but we've been working really hard to actually have professional information managers in every agency and department. Um, we have great models in the Agency of Human Services, which obviously is one of the largest collectors of um, of data that's relevant to this particular um, initiative in this bill, uh, they all operate within this rubric. So you won't find something in their laws that get down into some of the, the more weedy parts of it, but you will see it in the federal regulations that they have to comply with. And all those things carry forward, for example, to this bureau. So there's different ways that the General Assembly kind of finesses and how they want you know, you're standing up a new division, new bureau, and how this intersects. And there's just parts of this bill that I'm not sure if there were just unawareness of the bigger <coughs> scope that's already happening. Um, my fear is it just kind of sometimes takes a step back because we have maybe these agencies already working towards this and not all of a sudden something comes in that's very detailed and um, they kind of stop or someone carves out something. Um, so, so that's part of what we do. Um, in terms of the Public Records Act, um, oh, sorry, go on. It's okay, very interrupting. But this, um, so this is really helpful. Um, really, really appreciate your testimony. Um, maybe you're getting to it, but would you be able to actually um, look like um, point us to the sections? I know you mentioned page five, but yes, um, yeah. you know, tell us. Sure. Yeah. So this is a specific yeah. section that I was looking at that kind of draw drew out some comparison on page five was um, it's the new proposed section title three um, section five zero one three for data governance. Um, and so just to walk through that part, the first mm -hmm. thing, just in terms of the not the public records, because I know you've heard testimony on that. Um, I live and breathe Public Records Act every day in the history of that. We do have, um, you know, the background for it. it's been around since 1976, but it's actually been in earlier forms. Um, the definition of public record means written or recorded any anything that's written or recorded in the course of agency business. It's either produced or acquired. Um, it doesn't mean publicly available. And that was some information I heard during the walkthrough that you received that public record meant publicly available. And that, that's actually not, not true. It means government record. And part of that is to say, it's not your personal records. Um, so when it first came into law, there were public officials who were saying that records that were produced or acquired in the course of agency business were their own personal records. Um, so, so that's just something to be aware of for the Public Records Act. So I think that you would not want to carve out a unique division or bureau that's not subject to the same act that everyone else is. Because really when it sets forth that the definition of public record, it puts the, the responsibility on not only the agency as a whole, but each elected official, appointed official, classified staff person, everybody who's involved with that specific set of information or larger program to be on a very clear path to manage it responsible. Um, so part of that is through the exemptions process. For example, the Public Records Act will say, yes, you receive this, but we want a, we want a good balance of transparency of government actions, but also privacy of individuals. Um, and that's set forth by the policy of the Public Records Act. And then it's set forth on what is exempt from public inspection and copying. Um, and agencies are responsible. And we're still, you know, we still see a lot of pockets of unawareness. Um, you know, someone will say, oh, it's confidential, but they can't really cite the real statute. And so as we kind of walk through this, our goal is to make sure that everyone understands specifically what the General Assembly or federal government have put into place in terms of protections around certain 
certain sets of information and certain types of records. Um, and a lot of them are format independent. Doesn't matter if it's a data set, doesn't matter if it's a database, it doesn't matter if it's transition, it's still a textual document, maybe an electronic form. Um, those are all provisions that come with that definition of public record. And then there's also, um, if you look into part of that, I know there's been a lot of questions about how do we talk about when you receive information by law from another agency to do your work. Um, in 2021, last January, we published the data privacy report. Uh, it was done in concert with the chief data officer. It was based on information that we compile and provide that got it down into individual actual specific data. So if was it an address? Was it a phone number? Was it someone's birth date? Was it um, and so we we were able to run that through our system and provide that particular detail of which agencies are required to collect certain types of information. We did do demographics. Um, so that is part of what we do. So I, when I look at that, you know, not not a public record, it's actually old language that we used to have in statute um, before the Public Records Act. And it's because um, the way that we didn't have the definition before and the way that, you know, to put something in the public record in uh, the 1800s was to go to your town clerk's office and have something transcribed in the logging book. So, so it's really old fashioned, but it's really not, I don't think applicable unless the committee is really desiring to exempt this commission or this uh, division from that. The other parts, yes. Uh, Martin, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah, just, I just wanna clarify on, on that one before you move on to the next. Thank you very much, this is very helpful. Um, for that particular provision, it, it seems to me, maybe this is as much a, a question for the chair uh, of whether whether we should have our legislative council work to straighten this one out. Because because we have and uh, she was on earlier, but I don't see that she's on now. But but perhaps have uh, Amron uh, consult or work with Tanya because we want to just get this right. And I don't think that's our expertise. In right. This Right, no, that'd be great. I mean, I was thinking that maybe we don't need it, but, but yeah, definitely. Or, or if this just gets cut completely, but yeah. But, yeah. But, I think the no, point is that what they're after is to make sure that to give some um, solace to the uh, various agencies providing information to this division that the same protections travel with the with the, with those records to that division. And that's what I think we are after. I think that is uh, what, yeah. what Julio said, and I think that is what we're after. Uh, but if we could work on that language. But I did have one other specific question. Are, are courts subject to the Public Records Act or they, they have their own rules, don't they? Well, I'm not. <laughs> so underneath the definition of a public agency, underneath the Public Records Act, it includes branches. Um, and so it, you know, I've worked with the court administrator's office on different occasions where it has been articulated in terms of, you know, a public record is a government record. Um, they do comply with the public record fees um, within that. I do sit on the rules for um, public access to court records. I've been on that committee for over 10 years. Um, our office would say, based on the legislative intent, because we are the holder of the, the documents that lead into that, is that branch was added in the second round and was intended to be inclusive of actually all three branches. Um, there was, there's different opinion on that over the years in terms of legislative branch and, and the uh, judicial branch. From my perspective, I just want to make sure that everyone has the capability to manage their information in an appropriate way and they, you know, within the constructs of the law that's provided. So, um, so we work, we actually do have an active records and information management um, collaboration with the judiciary. We've had it since, um, since 2004 and work with the trial court operator, um, Terry Scott, who has since retired and, and Pat Gable. So, um, so in terms of what we do and, and what we do underneath the statewide records and information management program, they receive all the same services and all the same um, things from us. And so, and they're inclusive when we do do all the analysis. So um, I think it's just over the definition of public record and public agency that sometimes there's some mis difference of opinion on what was intended underneath that law. Um, it was passed at the same time as the open meeting law. And if you look at the open meeting law, it ex exempts the judiciary. And I think there's sometimes some overlap because of the way the open meeting law and some of the earlier public records laws were passed in the 50s. Um, they had different uh, constructs to them, but it does include branch and public agency. And that's the scope of the public records law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. I'm just... 
I think I'm really curious why we are, and maybe it's just something that's missing from my notes, but why we are trying to accept some of this information from being publicly accessible. Um, because there's, there's definitely sections of this bill where the information coming in in a raw format with identifiers and such um, absolutely would want to, to keep that from being publicly accessible. But I think some of the work of this council with the data, we would want accessible. And that seems clear with the establishment of MOUs for use of this. <laughs> Um, I would think that the legislature would want to see some of the data to revise our work and, and to make it better. So I guess I'm just curious at this point why we're exempting this data from public records in the first place. So I don't know if that's to the committee or to you. Yeah, that's but probably not to the witness. I, I'm yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not entirely sure we should we should um because I I I have quite the, the chip on my shoulder about not letting public have access to data that we deem important to collect, especially in this nature. So uh, I just. So underneath the provisions, and I don't know if this would help, is the sense is that if there's an exemption and the data is collected, say from the agency, from an agency of human services or one of its departments, and there's exemption on it, the intent of this law, if I understand, you know, what you're trying to achieve here is that there, the exchange of that information is not going to suddenly make that that information not subject to the exemptions, and and that's the case. So it's also opening. So if something is not exempt, it would actually carry through of having that. There's also capabilities within the de-identifying, which I think is a key part of what you probably want to achieve. And that can be more established through rulemaking of having, you know, the, the Bureau really establish how they would de-identify information. There is reference to a public use file. We don't typically see that in statute written out. It's usually in, um, and rules and regulations um, in terms of public use. But I think what you're trying to do is have a balance of that transparency and you just don't want to have the, you know, if something is exempt underneath an existing law and it's collected from another agency to provide, you know, the work of this, to, to uh, inform this particular bureau and what they need to analyze, um, you would not want that to be released or you can, you know, we can parse out specifically where all these legal requirements are for the committee um, or be it be part of the work that we normally do with any agency. And then they work through if they think they have to come back to the General Assembly to say this particular set of information is not currently exempt, but we we feel it is. And that's how the General Assembly goes through an exemption review process um, or it should not be exempt. Um, from that. But if you're only collecting from other sources and they already have, you know, their legal requirements around that, and that's going to be the work of this particular division and bureau to really understand all those legal requirements. And that's what, you know, the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration just does as part of our process for any public agency. Thank you. So, yeah, if you could um, continue going through the, the sections that, that Sure. And the other section that stood out was related to the retention. Um, so retention has been established since 1937 as having to sit with a particular public agency. Um, so it makes reference to um, changing this. So it's on line 13 on page five, where it says a division shall work with the agency of digital services on the collection and retention of data. And I'm not sure if right there you mean retention and disposition, because that does reside with the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. And one of the reasons we do that work, and it's been aligned with us, is that we have the responsibility of also making sure that we have identified permanent on continuing value. So records that have permanent ongoing continuing value to the state. Um, agencies and departments, including uh, the legislative branch and the judicial branch, actually transfer the custody of that information to the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, and we become the clearinghouse for it moving forward. Um, so this right now sets that the Agency of Digital Services would set the retention, which is a different agency and department um, that does not currently have that authority to do. And so that has been raised to us because it is something that's structurally different. Um, and I don't know if that was the intention of this committee. Um, 
Thank you, Martin. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, I don't think that was the, the intention. Uh, and, and it would seem to me that what we can do is it's a quick fix is that the division shall work with the archives, with the state archives or state archivist, whatever that language is that's appropriate. Yeah. And the question will re remain whether the Agency of Digital Services is an entity that should be part of that as well. In other words, is it the state archive and the Agency of Digital Services or or do we have to parse this provision out that there are certain components of this that really are within the jurisdiction of the arch archivist and others with the Agency of Digital Services? Do you have an opinion of that? Or, or is this something that you'd want this division, you know, all those items listed in, in that subsection three, are those all within your purview? Yeah, I, I would say in terms of that is already has to be done by this division by the nature of being part of the agency of administration. And we don't need, we don't see that carved out separately for any other entity in state government. So it would not be something that would be necessary in terms of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. I'd also say, but I can't really speak on the behalf of the agency of digital services is that they are like us. They're they're providing services to, to agencies and departments that's already carved out. We don't see unless somebody's asking, you know, either the state archivist or someone at agency of digital services to do something that's beyond what they currently do. Um, it doesn't normally have to be parsed out. I think, you know, when we have teams working through the records and information, man, they're not siloed. I don't make these decisions on my own, neither did my team. We actually have an interdisciplinary team that we require each agency to stand up and it has ADS representation. It has um, AGO or general counsel representation, depending on the agency. It has us either mentoring the records officers because by law there is um, each secretary and uh, commissioner has to designate a member of his or her staff as a records officer to manage their program and then it also has business liaison so it's it's designed specifically to be integrated and it i think to get to the testimony that's provided earlier is because there will be business processes that come up there will be compliance questions that come up there will be technology gaps or needs or uh, opportunities that come up and um, and that is already kind of built into naturally into what the General Assembly has established as part of the records management program for the state. So, so if I can just follow up. Um, so add archivist there or not I'm not sure I, I completely understood from from your answer is uh, or or is this just data retention is covered elsewhere and we don't need to put it in here. I'm trying to understand. Yes, data retention is covered underneath the work that we do and agencies and departments already have to come to the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration and work with me and my staff to, to receive that information, to, to develop those processes. So I guess so that's, that's already done then. Take it, out. it should be getting done. Um, I didn't say we had good maturity of, of how no, we did no, governance, no. but this gives the opportunity. And if I would say, if anything, um, it's more emphasizing that, you know, we do have these requirements and laws for agencies to, um, to collaborate and to work with not only ADS, but also with our, our administration. Those are already, they're already have to have their programs approved by the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration underneath Title III, 218. Um, it's been around since the 70s. Um, do all agencies do it well? Not necessarily. Um, you know, we've been on a huge change management for 10 years, um, but are there good models? So I think that's where if you emphasize it, I think it would be to more do a cross reference. If you felt it was necessary out of maybe concerns that maybe it wasn't going to be done underneath the current statutes, then maybe with cross-reference emphasis to Title III BSA 218, um, which is what this agency is subject to, um, which is that they have to have an active records management program that is approved by the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. That, that's the that, would, that would make sense to me. I, you know, I think, I, 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 I'm sorry, Madam Chair and uh, Mark, I mean, Martin, uh, Sorry, I was processing um, Tanya's uh, testimony and uh, I'm pretty excited about it actually, uh, because I think that the correlation between her testimony and the work that we've spent the last uh, year and a half doing, it's coming together. Uh, and your testimony was really solid in helping us get there. Thank you. So, 
So just to, to nail this down, it, I guess I just don't see the downside of listing the archivist in that provision. I mean, I, what the, I mean you know, it, it yeah. would have the division make very, very clear that the, the mm -hmm. archivist is in the loop on this if they have questions about these issues because you bring expertise to the table. Is, am, am I wrong about that? You're not wrong if you want to add it. My suggestion yeah. was just that it's already expected for those agencies. So if you want to put emphasis on it. Well, <laughs> it's needless to say, yeah, emphasis is critical uh, because of the nature of, of this particular bureau. Um, things need to be intentional. It's an important bill. And I think that this is one of the few opportunities that the General Assembly has to um, to really bring together information that we collect throughout the state, but that hasn't had quite focus. And so the, the, the effect of that though, is as we get into these other systems that are playing is that you will start seeing improvements. So if everyone's really collaborating um, in a good sense and working towards that effort, it's gonna have, um, it's gonna go beyond just this particular division. And so I mm -hmm. think there's lots of benefits to that from a state perspective. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And Madam Chair, I don't think I had anything else specifically. It was really related to that one section that was um, the new proposed statute of 3 BSA 5013. Um, okay. well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I do encourage you to, to work with our legislative council and so we can get the, get the okay. language right. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity. And I do want to say that if you ever need research, <laughs> historical research on acts we we do provide that support to legislators um and we also provide it to ledge consoles uh so um we're happy to provide any type of background or information or if you get into problem solving that's what we're here to do so i appreciate it i'll stay on in case something comes up um but i appreciate the opportunity today great thank you thank you so thank much you, thank you okay great so, sorry, sorry for that interruption madam chair no, 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 no worries. Thank you. Um, okay, so we don't have any other witnesses, but we were going to visit with legislative council. Um, how about if we take uh, like a five minute stretch break, five, 10 minutes? Yeah, so let's take 10 minutes and we'll, we'll be back and visit with Aaron. Thank you. So let's mute. Okay. Uh, Welcome back to the House Judiciary Committee. Um, Coach, I do see your hand up. Um, I think that was from before. I think that was from before. From before, okay, great. Okay. Um, so I want to welcome our Legislative Council. Good afternoon, Emeryn. And um, I don't um, know if you've been following the, um, the conversation regarding public records, but we thought it'd be helpful to to visit with you as a director of the bill to um, help us understand um, the intent of the language and some of the sections that were that were referenced. Um, so thank you. Certainly, for the record, Amarin Abergele, Legislative Council. I wish that I had been able to hear all of the testimony that you've heard so far because I feel like I, I missed some um, some good information and discussion. But I will just. Uh, look back to the language now that you have been discussing, um, which I believe you are looking at on page five, looking at the, the data collection section and talking about the Vermont's public records law. Um, so I, I think perhaps how I initially worded this may have, have alarmed, <laughs> have alarmed um, one or two of your witnesses. Uh, there are a lot of policy considerations around how you structure access to sensitive data as you sort of move through this process of establishing the new division. And I, uh, it's wonderful. I think you've heard from the state archivist, which uh, should be very helpful as you move through figuring out how this, um, how this section should operate. Uh, looking at the different types of I will say, uh, having not had a background on the work that you're doing for this division, I was a little bit hampered in, in drafting at the time on um, some of the finer details of 
where this data is coming from and where this data is going to be, um, I guess, physically, if you can say physically housed, right? So I'm envisioning you are going to you are going to be receiving by you. I mean, the division is going to be receiving different data sets from different state agencies, possibly other uh, entities that are that are not government agencies that perhaps are not subject to who are not currently subject to any of the uh, the uh, Vermont's public public records law, right? So I think when you're looking at how this process unfolds. Um, and what considerations are important for figuring out how these, uh, how the public records law is going to intersect with the management of this data. You have several points you're looking at. You're looking at the point where the data is either already existing with other entities, um, whether there's going to be new data that's going to be collected by other entities, which will eventually wind up over with this division. So presumably any data that is already currently being collected at agencies is covered by Vermont public records law, um, however that may be. Some of the information may be exempt from copying inspection. Uh, some may be information that's already publicly available. And so those entities that are already government entities in theory are either covered by Vermont's public records law or perhaps by the, the federal version FOIA. Um, and then the question is, is there going to be additional records that are provided it or data into this system that is from an entity, from a private entity, uh, such as a, a hospital or some sort of, uh, you know, something within the, the criminal justice system that is not a government entity. And so how do you want to treat that data as it's moving from an entity that's either not covered by the public records law into a state government system, um, whether you think that information or whether there's going to be any issues around that information entering. And this might be um, another topic that you could hear from either from other witnesses who have in information such as that or from the state archivist, how that situation might be handled. I do see a hand. I don't know if I should pause in my- Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I have a question and you don't have to answer right now if it's sort of coming later and it's it's really for you and I think for for um coach and and Martin just um so first of all really um I didn't jump in because I didn't have a question but just want to say how grateful I was for Tanya Marshall's testimony as especially as a former archivist myself like super super important perspective and I really um, support the direction of trying to really make the archive, state archives very central in this bill. Um, there was a question that was, you know, like I, I'm trying to understand how much of the uh, intent of some of the working around public records law was about protecting the privacy of individuals who might be, you know, comp composite parts of a, a big data set and just trying to kind of understand the intent around that. And if there are, if there's anything in public records law that we are gonna run up against if part of our goal is to protect the privacy of individuals. Uh, yes, uh, those are all good questions, and uh, some of the considerations that. Let's see, how should I start? Um, so there are a couple of issues that you're going to be look at when you are collecting data and how that, um, how that relates to the public records law. So if you have information coming from other entities that is that the information is exempt under the public records law um because it falls into one of the current exemptions those exemptions will follow follow the data so to speak to the new division so the and there are a couple considerations there if you are having multiple data sets from multiple places coming to one location um is there is there a chance that those multiple data points are all connecting are connecting from multiple places to one individual 
such that where they started, you would not be able to identify the person. But if you add in a second or third data set from different locations, would you then be able to identify the person such that they would that the information would now fall under one of the uh, the public records law exemptions? And is that something that the the division is going to know how to recognize? Um, and perhaps the answer is yes to that, and they can be trained on that. The the next question is where is the information uh, being housed? Is it going to be a database that is, and I think this, I did catch part of um, Ms. Marshall's testimony about the, the retention issue. And I think that in part was um, not an intention to say that retention should be governed by someone other than the, the records management policies that are, that are adopted in conjunction with the, uh, the state archivist's office, but <clears throat> to say that I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> but if you have information, let's see, let me back up for a moment. So if you have information coming in from multiple sources <clears throat> and looking at how to uh, determine whether new records exemptions applies, uh, if you say, yes, there are records exemptions that apply to some of this data, but not other data, is this a database that is run within the division or is the just the complexity and the magnitude of data um, such that the database itself is going to be run by a vendor outside of a state system, uh, in which case, how easily can the division access that information in response to a public records request? Um, when it is sort of housed within this vendor who the state may have, uh, for example, a contract where there's a certain cost each time you need to extract information from that data set. So that is, is an additional consideration and one that I really, having not much background on this, I'm not sure what the thinking is about where this will be housed, um, whether this is something that's going to be able to be within the division and they have their own database or whether it's something a bit more complicated that will need to be worked through a vendor on, in which case um, I would encourage you to you know, hear maybe more from the state archivist or other public records law experts about um, how the fees and the costs would work out in that situation. Um, and then an additional consideration when you're looking at data points from multiple sources is you know, under the public records law, there is a window of time when um, a uh, when an entity who receives a public records request, like the division, would be able to consult with other government uh, departments that have an interest in whether documents are released or whether they're withheld under the public records law, and is that time sufficient given where those where which entities that information is coming from. I see another hand. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah thank you. And then Barbara. Um, see if I can pull my question back up here. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot about, I guess, kind of how the system works as far as protecting some data. And I, I guess I'm just looking maybe for some examples um, um, why somebody's personal data would need to be protected. Uh, maybe an example why a name would need to be protected. Uh, I'm not saying it should or shouldn't be, uh, but I guess examples that way. And as far as this information goes, is there different levels of, I guess, lack of a better word, is there different levels of security on different information? And, and if so, is uh, at at some point, would all the information be uh, um, accessible depending on, say, a, a, a court case or an investigation or something like that? I know that was a lot, but you know, I don't even know if, all the, if those questions were for you, Amarin. <laughs> Uh, okay, let me start with in the order that I remember them in. Um, so one question about specific examples. Um, I think I do know that the, the RDAP report, the most recent RDAP report did mention that some of this data would be probably confidential under law. So I don't, I don't want to 
presume to provide an example because I am not that familiar, to be honest, with this type of data um, and how that would how that would play out here. So that would be an area that I would recommend you hear more about from entities maybe that currently house some of this information. Um, and in terms of others accessing the information, the public records law is, is a way for members of the public to access information that is not otherwise deemed confidential or should be withheld under law. There will always be other mechanisms to reach data, um, whether that be uh, litigation, um, some sort of auditing uh, type system, but usually within those, there are mechanisms for still preventing information that is sensitive and should not be publicly released from being introduced out into the public. But each is a, is, a, is a different mechanism from how the public records law uh, relates to the data. I feel like so, there was a third question that I missed. No, no, the, the two of them were kind of together and, and, and I got my answers there, but um, you brought up another one for me and, and it just, just left. <laughs> um, oh, about some of the, the way I took what, what you said is that some of the information just wouldn't be available. But what about in a, if it was sensitive to a court case or maybe a criminal case or something like that, it, uh, potentially there's information that still wouldn't be available? Uh, could you give me an, an example? You can answer it, I mean. So it looks like Coach might be able to Eric answer just popped on too. Eric. <laughs> um, Eric might be able to understand me a little better. He's used to me. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> we speak the same language, Representative Burdett, sometimes that's true. <laughs> but uh, I think a couple of examples that just leap to mind, and you're referring to court records, for example, juvenile proceedings are confidential. Uh, but yet the data that are well, underlying the proceedings might. Juvenile. Oh, juvenile, OK. Yeah. Uh, or, for example, a criminal conviction that has been expunged or sealed. The, the, those are confidential, and yet the, the underlying data is exactly the sort of thing that you want. That you want um, the I almost called them the bureau, the division, <laughs> to be collecting. So I think those might serve to illustrate situations in which you have confidentiality provisions by law applying, and yet you also want to still be able to collect this data. And, and as Amron was saying, I don't know how the public records piece of this would work, but you don't want to inadvertently be in a situation where multiple data collection avenues uh, provide an ability to figure out who somebody was when when uh, it's supposed to be confidential under law. Does that yeah, make sense? Great. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, the, I I can see a little balancing act in the in the whole process. So, right. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yep. Um. So then let's see, um, in terms of hands, Barbara, um, Felicia, you right here? Yeah. Felicia and Coach. And, and I'm sorry, Martin. Okay. So this is where I know I'm missing the order. That <laughs> I'm sorry. Martin was after me, actually. Oh, okay. And then whatever order they were on the screen, then, which okay, I think Barbara. was Barbara, then Coach. Okay. That's, okay. That's what I saw. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. Actually, I was Martin. just going to share the information that Eric did uh, with a couple other examples that we have um, that we've dealt with actually in the last session. So, so I guess here's my question: Is uh, why why wouldn't the in those examples that well, Eric and Amron, I mean, we've been talking about why wouldn't the Public Records Act? Uh, address those. I mean, if, if information has now been gathered by this bureau and it now can be used to identify somebody, wouldn't the Public Records Act address that situation? Because uh, now all of a sudden the exception exemption would apply. So I guess I'm, I'm struggling to understand in what situation the Public Records Act wouldn't apply. I do understand when you collect information from outside, but that's what a lot of government information is, is collected from third parties. And once it's gotten into the government, the Public Record Act applies, right? I guess I'm just not seeing 
this is a big issue except to say that the Public Records Act applies. I'm confused. I uh, I think there are, uh, I think you could, I think you could find that, um, that I, I, I think the challenge really is understanding whether there is um, enough information that is of a public nature that there's an obligation under the public records law to produce that information. And if so, will the division have the expertise to, to, do that given the multiple sources that the data is coming from. And hopefully, presumably the answer is yes, they would be able to figure that out. And then the next question is, is that something that is, is doable within, A, within the time constraints of the public records law, given potential, potentially the magnitude of the data? Um, and B, are there any considerations that should be made about um, the, the costs of, of accessing data that is perhaps not stored on state servers necessarily? And this is not to say that there isn't information that, the, that, the, um, that anything that is being produced by the division isn't also still subject to the public records law and if need be can be redacted down so that uh, people can see the information that is publicly accessible, but without that personally identifying information to uh, cover those instances of, of confidentiality. Uh, so I think the, the answer to your question is, is yes, the public records law can, um, is I think in theory designed to cover all of these situations. And I think the question is, are there instances where uh, there can be an equal amount of transparency through having the, the data available within the agencies that originally collect it, um, such that having it then apply again at the division, is that necessary? And that certainly is a question for, for you. I, I raise these more as, as considerations, not because I, I believe that it it should apply or shouldn't apply, but if the the RDAP report is is saying that certain um, records are bound to be confidential under a law, then uh, I think there are considerations of how uh, this committee wants to balance that public transparency with the need to protect the privacy um, or protect the the information that is required to be, or excuse me, the information that would be withheld under the public records law. So, and I feel like these are conversations that I feel like we did not get a chance really to discuss in depth and you know, my not having been involved with this committee pr prior to this, I perhaps was a little off the mark in how I was describing this in the draft. So I would, I mostly put all of these questions out to you so that um, you can consider them fully, decide where the, where the line should be. Um, I know that in the past, and again, maybe the, the state archivist can have some input on, on the history of this, there, there have been information that just under the statute is, is determined to be confidential, which automatically would make it exempt uh, from copying and inspection under the public records law. Or is there enough should I pause? No, no, I was just gonna do oh, a, a follow-up, but go ahead. Yeah. Thought, um, I'm sorry. I do see that I do see there's another hand, so I don't know if I should keep going, but um and it's gone. Uh well, let me yeah. if I could just just real quickly, just so everybody understands, this bill coming to us was not pre-baked. You know, it, it, we expected this discussion. Uh, we, we put this out as best we could in the very short time frame that we actually had. So, so uh, you know, this, this is exactly what we should be doing is figuring out that kind of policy question. Uh, but it seems to me that the Public Records Act, the straightforward, of course, it's not straightforward, but as, as much as possible, I don't want to try to rejigger the Public Records Act in this bill. You know, I want to rely on what we already have uh, uh, out there. Um, so it's obviously going to take some more thought though. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, Felicia, um, yeah. Question. Yeah. And then, um, and then I think 
Coach and Barbara, I see your hand is down, but so it's Felicia and then Coach. Yeah, so Amarin, I'm on uh, page six on line nine. And actually, I guess what I'm, I would be thinking would be on line 13, that um, subsection C2. <coughs> but it has here that the division shall develop methods of to permit sharing and communication of the data between state agencies, local agencies, and external researchers, including the use of data sharing agreements. It seems to me that within that language, you're saying that there is a way to desensitize this data in such a way that if external researchers can have access, so can the public. And, and data that would be confidential under public records, I guess, from a lay opinion, would also be confidential to an external researcher. Um, so if we already have that in there, would we just be able to add on to that <coughs> section there to, to really simplify, I think, what the, the conversation we're having in is to add in the there has to be a way to come up with a data sharing provision for the public. But like, if it means that we're storing data in two formats, de-identified or desensitized and sensitized data, that can happen so that it's not onerous to access the data in, in the event of a public records request. Um, but I think we're already kind of spelling out how we would share this data and that it is a priority to share this data. So I don't know, I, I just, I think there needs to be spelled out in a bill and I don't really have a strong opinion on where it's warehoused, that the data needs to be stored in a way that it can be accessed by the public, should it be, within the realm that the public could have access to it. So I mean by that is like if it would fall under a public records request, if some part of that data could be accessed by the public, then that data needs to be stored in an accessible format. So if that's two data sets, that's two data sets. Um, but I just it 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 is really problematic to me to silo this data in any format from the public because I think that really reduces accountability. It, it reduces um, the intensity of the work that the division would do because there'd be no real public access to the data from which they were they're drawing their work. And I think I would want their work to be as transparent as bulletproof as possible, so I think they're doing important work. Um, so it's seeing that section C2, the external researchers is included in here outside of state and local agencies. It seems to me that that would be an ideal point to add in some language regarding how we are intending to let the public maintain their access to data that they right, should have access to. And, and I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on like, is that something that is a draftable um, objective or is that something that is kind of going to be piecemeal throughout the bill? So a couple of thoughts on uh, those, on, on your thoughts. Uh, the section that you're looking at, because I, uh, so just to put this in context, um, this is about the requirement that the division adopt and develop a data governance policy um, and uh, methods to permit sharing and communication of data, you know, between the division and state agencies, local agencies, and possible uh, external researchers. So I think what might be helpful for the committee would be to hear from other entities that from other state entities that have databases that use data sharing agreements. The difference between um, a public records request and a data sharing agreement, and I am not an expert on data sharing agreements, uh, is that 
there are in theory mechanisms within the dating sh data sharing agreement to ensure that the or not to ensure but to incentivize the person who's part of the agreement from not sharing that information such as you know breach of contract other legal mechanisms to pursue if the person agrees to not share any confidential information and then does it could be um, that some of this information that is confidential by law uh, could not be shared even with a data sharing agreement. And I don't know what uh, the laws around this, these particular sets of data. So I am not sure whether that is this circumstance. I don't, um, but there may be some sets of the data that would be appropriate for a data, data sharing agreement that has other legal mechanisms for ensuring that confidential information is not shared outside of that one uh, researcher. So that's one thing to think about that I would say you could get more information on from other, other state entities that do data sharing agreements. Um, and then the other, I think, uh, avenue that you're talking about really are, are the public use files. Right, that data that can be taken directly from the database, scrubbed in a sense of the the identifying information, such that it can be released. The information that would normally be exempt from the public from uh, inspection and copying under the public records law could be removed, and then those public use files are available for anyone who wants to go in and use that data. Uh, so I think those are sort of the two the two areas where you could foresee um, you know, a possibility outside of the public records law for people to use the data in a way that you are still ensuring <clears throat> or endeavoring to protect that information that's otherwise confidential by law. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome. Coach? Uh, um, thank you, Emma. Uh, what we already have in existence, what Amron is referring to, um, not only by virtue of the sharing agreements that, for example, Crime Research Group um, with the judiciary and with the Department of Public Safety uh, for the um, fair and impartial policing data uh, that is shared for all 60 plus law enforcement agencies. We have similar um, standards set uh, within the agency of education around child data specific um, to um, disability, race, and other protected classes. Uh, because our school sizes are so small, identifying specific numbers in some cases will tell you exactly who the person is. Um, so there are very specific tools that have been designed uh, in that agency, as well as in the Agency of Human Services. Um, dealing with uh, DCF uh, and uh, children uh, under the care, you know, and custody of the state, you know, fall into very specific categories, but they're the exact same individuals across the spectrum that are affected by the request that we're trying to make and the observations we're trying to make from a research perspective. So um, we've been doing this for a while, obviously. Uh, and as uh, it's been said by a number of my fellow uh, committee members, this is important information to be able to share and understand so that we get a better idea of where the disparities actually are. And then what we can do from a policy perspective to hopefully um, mitigate you know, some of that. Um, so it, it's, it's an exciting time, you know, uh, it, it was just like listening to Tanya, you know, and um, I don't know where my library interest came from, uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was exciting to hear, um, 
you know, the work that's done by the archivist. Um, so I, I think we've got uh, several witnesses coming up. Uh, we're gonna hear from uh, DCF, we're gonna hear from the Department of Public Safety, you know, and I think we can ask this specific question uh, to them as they uh, come forward as to how they deal with disaggregating data and, and that component. Thank you, Coach. Yeah. Anything else? I, uh, I need to think a little bit first before I ask more questions. I, I think Coach has some great points that we can kind of see how other state agencies handle this. <clears throat> I do just want to point out that DPS and uh, DCF do have ways to scrub information in order to comply with public records. And I will expect nothing less of the division. I just, it's gonna be such a sticking point for me. So I'm so curious to see how they're doing it so we can incorporate it into this bill. Um, but I, I don't think we can have a siloed division with data that nobody else has access to. That is right. just- <coughs> right. yeah, yeah. I think we're all the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, that's that's helpful. Thank you, Felicia. And then we could, yeah, just as we do hear from the other witnesses, they'd be thinking of a path forward in a possible, you know, then it's going. Yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Sounds like another subcommittee member here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, with that, then let's uh, adjourn. Thank you, everybody.